Hi, I thought I'd tell you about Marguerite, Countess of Blessington. Not that many people know about her, but they should. She was a girl with guts and determination in a period where many women were very much subjugated to their husbands. She was born in, in 1788. She was Irish. She was born to a father who was a drunkard, a wastrel, and had been accused and tried for murder. Acquitted, but that was a political decision, I think. He sold her. When she was about 14 and a half, he sold her in marriage to an English soldier, soldier who beat her up because he was insane. He imprisoned her, she starved, she escaped after three terrible months. What happened to her then is a little bit vague. She seems to have traveled around Ireland to various family members and people who would look after her. She was eventually taken under the care of another English army officer who whisked her off to England, where he put her up in a country house for nine years. She was pretty isolated socially. So she made use of the library in this house. And in that nine years, Sally Farmer, as she was then called, educated herself and became really knowledgeable in art and antiquities, in history. She really became a very educated woman. Not long after that, her mad husband luckily died in a drunken fall from a window. This was the best thing that ever happened to her because she then was introduced to and married the Earl of Blessington. He paid her protector for her. He repaid for her keep, her jewels, her clothes. So in effect, she was sold twice already. When the Earl of Blessington married her, life began very differently. She was kept in the lap of luxury. They had a beautiful house in London. They had a salon where people visited them. And then they got bored. He was immensely rich. He was an absentee la Irish landlord. And he just lavished everything upon her. Subsequently, they went traveling on the continent because one of the reasons was, first of all, he got bored very quickly. Secondly, she was ostracized because she'd been a kept woman. She'd been ostracized from polite London society. All these hypocritical high society ladies who were probably all having affairs couldn't receive her because she'd been known to be kept outside of marriage. And so she had quite a difficult life in that sense that she didn't have very many women friends. So they went to live on the continent. They were there for several years. On the way down to Naples, which was their goal, they stopped off in Genoa where they met Lord Byron. And they spent some weeks together visiting each other. During that time, she made notes of all the conversations she had with him. And these notes were to prove invaluable later on in life when she had to earn her living by writing. When they were in Naples, they had met a young, handsome, tall, gorgeous Frenchman called Count or Alfred Dorsey. Very young. Lord Blessington seems to have fallen in love with him because he was taken into their household and became one of the family. Lord Blessington then said to this handsome young Frenchman, if you marry one of my schoolgirl daughters that he had from an earlier marriage, I will make you my heir, I will give you my fortune and you will have everything you could possibly want, which of course the guy agreed to, why wouldn't he? Subsequently, he married this young girl straight from an Irish protected environment. She was 15, he married her. There was a lot of scandal because a lot of people thought that this Count Dorsey was not Lord Blessington's lover, but Lady Blessington's lover. I don't think he was, but I don't think he was interested in women, but we don't really know about that and probably don't really care. They then left Naples after a lot of traveling around Italy about which she also wrote about. When they came to live in Paris, Lord Blessington stupidly went out one very hot day after lunch and died. So he was 49. This left this profligate, young, handsome, gorgeous count 
in full possession of the Irish estates, the lands, the house in Dublin, everything. And all that his wife got was a £2,000 annuity, which doesn't sound much now, but somebody told me it's equivalent to about a quarter of a million pounds now, which is not terrible for an annuity. But anyway, that's what she got. And they all came back to England, where the scandal grew and grew that here she was living in her household with this young man and his schoolgirl wife, and everybody assumed that the young Count and Lady Blessington were having an affair. What happened then was that she needed to make a life for herself and a living for herself. So she started salons to which the statesmen, the politicians came, writers, artists, poets, all sorts of people in the higher society of London, the men came. The women, of course, wouldn't be caught dead anywhere near her, but the men came. And so she established this salon at the same time because she needed money. She started to write. She wrote, in the end, 20 novels. And you have to remember this was the, this was the years of three volume novels. So the quantity was enormous. She wrote books of travel. She wrote a very interesting book about her conversations with Lord Byron, which is still used today by academic Byronists. Um, she wrote lots of pretty awful poetry. She also became the editor of two gift annuals, which were extremely popular in the 1830s and 1840s, very, very expensively produced um, little compendia of poetry and prose and illustrated plates, which were given as Christmas gifts. And she edited two of those um, for, for several years because she needed the money. While she was running her salons as well as writing, she made two very special friends, friendships, uh, one of which was with Edward Bulwer-Lytton, who was the owner of a great pile in Hertfordshire called Nebworth. Bulwer-Lytton was the most successful novelist of his day, although now he's made fun of. Uh, one of his books was the progenitor of the thing called the Bad Sex Award which is not a tremendous recommendation because his books are extremely wordy. But nevertheless, he was the most, pop apart from Walter Scott, the most popular author of his time. And her other close friend who valued her friendship enormously was Benjamin Disraeli, who was young, who was trying to start out in politics, but was also in that, those days a novelist. And both of these up and coming young men valued her enormously. She took on huge amount of debt, care of her family. She looked after her father, her sisters, her brother, and all of his family. And she had to keep getting the Count Dorsey out of all the debt that he got into because he went through his fortune in no time at all. Gambling, horse racing, clothes, of course. He just mounted up debt after debt. In the end, what happened was she couldn't bear to be in debt anymore. She put her beautiful house, all of its precious treasures, up for auction. She sent Dorsey off to Paris to avoid his creditors, because in those days he would have been thrown into debtor's prison, and she couldn't stand that for him. She then left for Paris. Her, her properties were all sold, her debts were all paid off, there was a very small surplus. And her solicitors couldn't get an answer from her. What did she want to do with the surplus? And it transpired that six weeks after arriving in Paris and being welcomed into the circle of the soon-to-be president of, of the Republic, whom she'd succored in London while he was um, in exile, she'd looked after him and given him a home, um, she died six weeks after arriving in Paris. And that, in sum, is the total of her life. Why I admire her is that she really had to make her own way in a world that was hostile to women who wanted to achieve, to women who had been kept in a relationship outside of marriage. And she had made her way in a male world, which was a pretty, it wasn't unique, but she did it with a tremendously good heart, I feel, and, and a huge amount of energy and strength of purpose and character. And that's my Marguerite Countess of Blessington.